the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus puts his disciples very firmly on the spot in this morning's Gospel. Having asked them what sounds like a fairly neutral and unthreatening thing, what, what are people saying about me, he then turns around and sharply asks the unavoidable personal question, so what about you? And the key difference in the answers given is something to do with the relationship of the apostles with Jesus, and indeed their sense of his presence as making all the difference. Who do people say that I am? Well, possibly one of the prophets, say the apostles. Possibly somebody who looks towards a future that is yet to come. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Perhaps Jesus is simply someone who, like so many others, points forward to the new world. And then Jesus says, but is that what you think? Do you think that my words, my actions, are simply looking forward to something that's not yet here? And the force of Peter's reply is in effect to say, no, this is here. This is the messianic time. This is when God is acting to redeem and heal and restore his people. This is now. And there, I think, is the key difference. What makes Jesus more than just one of the prophets? Where Jesus is, the future has arrived. The kingdom is there. And so the first thing to note in the gospel is that sense of Peter responding in and from the present moment. This is where we are. We are in the new age. When we're in the presence of Jesus, we are in the presence of the age to come. And our relationship with Jesus, therefore, is not just that of standing alongside looking forward, but being welcomed into a new framework, a new set of relationships. So what follows from this? This, says Jesus, is something that Peter has not simply learned by looking around, weighing up views, and coming to conclusions. It's a matter of re revelation. Just like the enlightenment that Buddhists talk about, it is something that happens in the moment. The moment becomes luminous, and in that moment the world changes, here and now. Where Jesus is, now is the kingdom. And that recognition, that moment of enlightenment, is that on which the church is built. It's that which is the rationale of the church. It wouldn't have one otherwise. The church doesn't simply say, we have an interesting program for the future. We have a manifesto. We have some thoughts about likely outcomes. It doesn't look forward in that sense. Nor does it simply say, well, we exist in order to keep alive the memory of that great dead teacher so much missed, the late Jesus of Nazareth. No, the church says, now is the moment. Now is the day of salvation. To be alive, alert, with our eyes open, awake, here and now. That is the reality on which the church stands. A moment here and now where we see past and future in the light of Jesus Christ, who is living now, drawing us to him now, transforming our vision and perception now. And I suppose it's that that makes a bit of sense of the promises given to Peter and through and in Peter to the whole of the apostolic community. And it's worth bearing in mind, of course, that what is being said here is about the apostolic community, not just about the ministry of Peter, not just about the ministry of the Twelve, but about the reality of the Church. What follows from this enlightenment, this moment of realization? Well, a number of things. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Hell, of course, here is used in the usual sense that it has in much of scripture. This is Sheol, this is the land of the dead, this is where the departed live. 
and the gates of the kingdom of the dead cannot stand against the reality of Christ's community and Christ's body. The past is not locked up and sealed and bolted. The unfinished business, the hurts, the failures, the disasters in our collective human past and in our individual human pasts cannot remain closed off from the enlightenment of Christ. Christ in this present moment sheds a light back through human history, as in that great orthodox icon of the resurrection. Christ stands in the middle of the darkness of the land of the dead, seizing Adam and Eve by the hand and saying, you're not being left here. You're coming with me. You have a future. So when we say that the gates of hell can't stand against the church, we perhaps should discipline a little bit our melodramatic, um, cinematic imagination, stop thinking about crusading sieges, and just think of that steady pressure against the doors of death and forgetfulness. And remember that the light of Christ tells us that the entire human world, the entire human past, can still be embraced by the reality of Jesus and transfigured by the reality of Jesus, and along with us, given a future in the love and communion of Jesus. The past is not locked, sealed, and finished with, whether our collective past or our individual past. The gates of hell shall not prevail and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The judgments that the church makes ought to be, and can be, the judgments of God. Put like that, it's a rather frightening thing, and the church has rather leapt on all the possible misunderstandings of that, and said, you know, if you listen to us, you listen to God, end of story. But in this context, surely it means something much richer and much more challenging for us. To live in that moment of illumination and insight, that moment when the whole of the human past is somehow opened up to transformation, is to begin to see something of God's purpose, God's universal healing purpose and the future to which that points. And what we are learning as we learn to be the church is to have discernment about what does and doesn't belong to and in the kingdom. What kinds of behavior in ourselves won't sit easily with the kingdom. We can easily think of that, the kinds of behavior that do indeed seek to block off, ignore or bury an uncomfortable history collective or individual, the behaviors in ourselves that seek to lock doors against others in their need and in their hope, the behaviors in ourselves that seek to pursue our own membership or citizenship in the kingdom of heaven at the expense of or simply ignoring the hope of others. Those are the behaviors which the kingdom can't accommodate. When we live by those principles, the kingdom slips out of view. And so to have the keys of the kingdom, to have the discernment which on earth somehow reflects and mediates the perspective of God in heaven, that requires us to have the most rigorous, the most consistent scrutiny towards our own habits, our own behaviors, are we living in this transforming moment, the nowness of Jesus flinging open the doors of light on the darkness of death? Are we living in this moment when our guilt or denial about the past and our fear and panic about the future are alike dissolved? Can we live there in that moment? Because if we can, if we can, then the gates of hell can't prevail and the doors of the kingdom are open. And that's why, of course, this is a story about resurrection faith. 
It makes sense in the context of Peter himself being remembered as one of the first witnesses of the resurrection, not literally the first. That, of course, is Mary of Magdala and the women at the tomb, but the first of the apostles to enter into that renewed sense, that renewed vision. This is a story about resurrection faith and a reminder that the essence of the church is its resurrection faith. Peter, as addressed and commissioned here by Jesus, stands for the church, the community that is there to witness to the resurrection, to witness to the way in which the presence here and now of Christ's life sheds new light on past and future, draws us into the eternal present of God. The moment when we see without fear, distortion, pride, etc., etc., we see the love that made us and sustains us. And we see what it is that Christ's liberation means. That's the heart, the essence of the church, the rock on which the church is built. And the church is truly the church when it lives in that present, hoping for God's future along with all the buried and hurt and destroyed past. When it lives in the hope of redeeming memories, when it is free to discern what does and doesn't belong in the life of the kingdom. And when the church does that, it does indeed bind and loose in God's name. And it hardly needs saying, this is not, so to speak, an institutional promise that when the institutional and visible church makes judgments, they're God's judgments. No, it is properly a theological and, forgive the jargon, eschatological promise. It's about what we hope for. It's about the ultimate horizon of the church's reality. What we all of us as an apostolic community are praying for, struggling for and hoping for and frequently failing in, is to arrive in that transforming, luminous, present moment, the gift of God to Peter in that wonderful epiphany, which prompts him, spurs him to speak as he does. We pray to live in that moment, and in that moment to hear and absorb God's freedom, God's light, into our own perspective on ourselves and our world. We struggle constantly with how to cope with our past, our history. We've seen it, of course, in recent weeks in all the debates that have arisen around Black Lives Matter and the, the fate of the statues in our streets and on our buildings. But that's really just the tip of an iceberg in our confusions and struggles about our past. It's very tempting to leave the gates of hell firmly shut and withdraw. Too difficult, too challenging to think that the past might be both confronted in absolute honesty and repentance and transfigured in hope. But that's what we're in the business of. And when, as the church, we gather as we do today to celebrate the Holy Eucharist, we are doing what the church needs to do, standing in that moment where we perceive that Christ now brings in the kingdom. Recollecting the difficult memory of a past where we, we've betrayed and failed in the same night in which he was betrayed. That's when the Eucharist is happening. And praying that the life and light we receive in the sacrament transforms our vision of the world so that our discernment becomes as keen as our hope and our trust. Peter himself, as we know all too well, made a spectacularly bad job of living out all those promises and all those realities. It doesn't take more than about five minutes for Peter to slip back into the default setting. Remember, Jesus predicts his passion and Peter says, don't even think about it. And Jesus runs on him with one of the most furious and surprising denunciations in the whole of the Gospels. 
Get behind me, Satan. You are speaking precisely for everything that the kingdom is not. And Peter, betraying his Lord on the night of the Last Supper and the trial and agony of Jesus, Peter with all his questions and confusions, Peter with all his uncertainties, Peter, if we needed it, Peter is the symbol of the church's model and failure as much as of the church's truth and consistency. But in this moment, in this one precious now, where Peter says, you are the anointed one, you are the future, here and now in the present, in that moment, Peter stands for all that the church can be and is called to be. And as we gather in that moment, looking to the present made real here and now, the future that comes to us here in the flesh and blood of Christ, in the flesh and blood of our community, even if virtually realized on screen. Nonetheless, here and now, we are set free with Peter to make the confession which makes sense of the church. You are the anointed one, we say to Jesus. You are God's child in our midst. You are what God is bringing to birth in history, and bringing to birth here and now in us and for us. And as we break bread and drink wine, as we open ourselves to that gift, even if only virtually at the moment, nonetheless, the keys of the kingdom are given to us. The discernment of true judgment about the kingdom begins to grow in our hearts. And the gates of the kingdom of death fly open. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.